Hey, hi everybody. Happy Monday and thank you for all joining. We'll give everyone just another minute or two to join. I see we have Mr. Gray on the line. So, hi, there we go. <laughs> Good, perfect. Thank you for coming. We're all very excited. We'll just give everyone just one more minute to join and I've recorded it. Um, just again, there are people that uh, cannot make it today because they're working. So then they can uh, just hear everything when they have a minute. Um, and it will only be uh, given to people who have paid, um, not to anybody else. So you can thank me. Okay, so we will get started. So we have Mr. Gray on the line here. Um, and uh, I have a couple questions that I'll start off asking and then we will kind of just raise your hand if you have questions. We're gonna keep this uh, to an hour. If we can keep it a little bit less then that's great. Um, but uh, again, I wanna make sure that we get all the answers that we need to get. Um, so the 15th is coming and it looks like CN may not change their date again. So if that's the case, then you kind of wanna know what's going on uh, on the legal front. So. I guess there's started off, there was two questions, but I'll start off with the one. Um, I know that there, Leighton uh, or Mr. Gray, there was a chat about uh, challenging the ministerial order. I was just wondering if you're able to provide any updates on that, if that was a plan of action still, or maybe we're looking at a different route. Um, well, this gets at uh, what, you could do if CN follows through on their threat. Um, that is if they follow through on their threat to, well, they say place everyone on uh, involuntary un, uh, unpaid leave. I call that termination. Mm -hmm. But if they fall through on that threat, what do you do then? Uh, at that point, um, I think that the approach that should be taken is that you would sue CN uh, for damages arising from human rights violations. The challenging the ministerial order um, is something that can be done. Um, you can make a complaint to the, to the labor board. Um, I think I show, I sent Abby a copy of a complaint that was filed on behalf of Air Canada workers yeah. That would be along the same lines. So that's something else that could be done. Um, I don't know how effective that that would be. I, I, I should follow up with the lawyers who filed that, um, uh, that labor board complaint uh, to see whether they got any, any response. The one thing that is peculiar about, uh, about this situation, about CN, is that we've sent two letters each of them asked for a response, a meaningful response, and also asked to hear from CN's lawyers. And, and we haven't. Um, to me, that's, that's somewhat uh, unusual, um, almost improper. So, so um, one next step I was thinking about doing is perhaps even trying to get in touch with CN's lawyers. Right. The problem there is that uh, uh, they probably have several different lawyers acting in different provinces, so it'd be tough to narrow that down. Um, but if we did a search of head office, we probably could find out where their head office, uh, who their lawyers are in their head office. But the, the short answer to your question is, if they follow through, you know, then you then you sue them. Um, now, having said that, in the ministerial in the ministerial order, it does say. Uh, it does provide for a real deadline of, uh, I believe it's the end of January of the new year. If you read the ministerial order, it talks about November 15th, requiring people to declare vaccination status, um, but um, it doesn't actually require people to be fully vaccinated, whatever that's going to mean by then, until the end of January. So arguably, January end of January is the effective date. The 15th of November date is one that uh, 
they're leaving out there to cause everyone to worry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what should I do? You know, should I declare my vaccination status? Um, if you want to know my advice on that, I can, yeah, I can give that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I so, say something? Um, sorry, just a little CN employee here. Um, just gonna wait until the end, please. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, if you declare your vaccination status, um, in my view, what you're doing is you're providing information to the employer to which they're not entitled. Um, the your vaccination status is uh, medical information. It's private. They're not entitled to it under the law. There's no law, provincial or federal, that entitles um, your employer to that private medical information, um, nor is there any case that I'm aware of in Canada which would, would entitle an employer uh, to demand that information from you. The employer, your employer, you can see this in the ministerial order, is behaving as though, they, they, they call it a ministerial order, but it's really a policy statement. They're declaring as though what they say is law, uh, and it's not. Uh, it is not the law of Canada that uh, getting a COVID-19 vaccine is a bona fide occupational requirement. A bona fide occupational requirement is something that you must have in order to uh, do your work. Clearly, all of you have been working without being vaccinated for nearly two years for CN without this vaccine. And so the argument that you need, that there's some, suddenly there's some safety requirement, there's some, that suddenly this vaccine is necessary to ensure the safety of workers uh, really has no foundation in fact, law or science. Um, and I think it's important to understand, and I'll frame this again for those who weren't on the original call, what we're really talking about here. What the employer is actually doing is they are putting, they are acting out a government, uh, a, a government mandate. This is coming from the government of Canada. It's coming from the prime minister's office. The federal government has no constitutional authority over health. Only the provinces do. So, but what the Prime Minister's office is doing is they're weaponizing um, the federal public service to do their dirty work, to do indirectly what the Government of Canada cannot do directly. There's never been a national vaccine mandate of any kind for Canadian public workers or for Can Canadians, period, um, because it violates human rights. It's a blatant human rights violation. So what is happening to you, the reason why this is happening is the government of Canada is using CN, is using CP, is using other uh, actors in the Canadian public service, Air Canada, WestJet, others, in order to execute a, a policy. And the policy is simply this. They want you to trade your liberty, your freedom, the integrity of your body, your freedom to choose what goes into your body in exchange for the security of a job. And they're betting and they're banking that you will do it. They're betting and banking that you will find that your security is more important than your liberty. And if you make this trade, and maybe some of you are thinking about doing it, what I would say to you is, um, uh, where is that going to take you? The, all the people who are double vaccinated, the ones who you might, maybe you work with them or you know them, and they're turning up their noses and they think that vaccinated people are disgusting and gross and they're the worst people in the world, those people now are no longer fully vaccinated. And so they may as well be unvaccinated. Uh, by the way, the whole vaccinated versus unvaccinated narrative is totally breaking down. I don't know if you follow sports at all, but famously, mm -hmm. uh, NFL fo football quarterback Aaron Rodgers, yeah. he got COVID and he's surrounded by double vaccinated people. Sidney Crosby, who we don't know if he's vaccinated or unvaccinated, he has COVID-19. We know that the NHL has a mandatory vaccina vaccination policy. So either Sidney Crosby had, uh, was double vaccinated and still got COVID, or he was unvaccinated, his team granted him some sort of exemption, and he got COVID while surrounded by vaccinated, double vaccinated people. 
So this narrative is breaking down. It's false. It's phony. It's fake. And it's vile. It, 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 and, and we have to, I think we have to fight it. We have to keep fighting. Um, there is a price to be paid for liberty. Um, and, you know, our generation by and large, except for our military people and their families have not had to pay it. Um, but now those of us who are in the civilian life are being called to pay a price for our freedom. If we don't fight for it, we're going to lose it. We've lost a lot over the past couple of years. These governments, we were too silent. We were too compliant through the lockdowns. And a lot of the people who stood up, especially lawyers and doctors and MLAs and MPs and city councillors, people who had the ability to stand up, uh, didn't do it. And so now what's, been ha what's happened is now they're coming for, and now I've got doctors calling me. I've got doctors going to lose their medical licenses. And uh, they knew that the, the COVID science was bunk. And they, they sat quietly in their little corner thinking, well, this is just going to pass over. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody, uh, somebody's put, put, a, put some red blood on my door. Uh, no, no, <laughs> they're, they're coming for us. And there's a reason why they're coming for us. Um, it's because we are the best Canadians. We are the hard workers. We're the ones who pay all the taxes. We're the ones serving on the school trustee boards. We're the ones driving all the kids to hockey and soccer and dance and karate and everything like that. We're living out the Canadian dream. We were the Canadian life and the people who are putting this on us uh, have no regard for us. They have no regard for our lives. And uh, so this is being weaponized. And I'm, I'm giving you this long winded explanation because I know many of you must be feeling this right now. You're feeling the pressure. Um, and that's by design. That's what that November 15th day is there for. It's by design. They want you to crack. They want you to give in. They want you to be scared and come out and announce your vaccination status. Well, my advice is don't do it. They're not entitled to it. You can do it if you want to, mm -hmm. um, but um, it's not going to buy you time. The effective date is going to be the end of January. And if, as I said, if they do follow through on these things, then what we're going to do is we're going to sue them. And uh, we're going to sue them for... Uh, it's going to be a big, it's going to be a big, big number. Um, and we're going to sue them for human rights violations. Um, I being, think that, go ahead. Yeah, for that being said, so let's just, let's play it out. So November 15th comes out, members are all laid off without pay. Okay, now we need to actually take legal action because something's actually been done. What from like legally, like what is the first step that like a law firm would do? Because like they have the, the letter, that outlines mm -hmm. everything. Now what? Now what do you? What 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 was your? What what do your? Sorry. What does your firm do? Um, I'm, I'm do already drafting. Already, I'm already drafting the lawsuit. I'm already oh, drafting. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. already working on it. Yeah. Um, my understanding though is that um, the effective date in the ministerial order is actually the end of January. That the 15th of November is when they require you to declare your vaccination status. And now they've um, updated it. Yeah. They've, they've they now changed it to the 9th. They need to know by the 9th of November, not the 15th now. So, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. They just, well, I think that just happened like a week ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it gives Sorry, you that. Can I clarify very quick? Sure. Sure. Um, they stated that the 15th is the requirement to have one dose of, mm -hmm. of the vaccine and then continue working. The 24th is to have two doses. The 24th of November? The 24th, uh, 24th of January, of January is January. to have two doses. The 15th, you have to have at least one or have a valid medical or religious exemption, was what they said. Right. And if you don't, then they uh, can single you out and try to put you on this involuntary uh, unpaid leave of absence. Right. Right. Yeah, so, it was kind of different in, in the order. Like I read it too. Like it didn't really say a hundred percent. It just said you had to be fully vaccinated or something by the fifteenth. Or it was like it was very weirdly written mm -hmm. that it could be interpreted like differently depending on who's reading it. So mm -hmm. I didn't really know how to take it either. I thought maybe the January was like the official deadline too. So mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I I'd be interested to know everyone's thoughts about 
whether or not they think that uh, CN is actually going to carry through on this. And we'll hold on. Everyone... I don't want everyone piping in right now, but <laughs> yeah. I, I can tell you my view is yeah. um, I don't know how they can. I mean, the workers that um, that that they're proposing to to remove are not easily replaceable, right? Um, these are skilled workers, uh, you know, usually skilled, experienced tradespeople um, that have uh, a lot of experience and very specific skills that are necessary. And of course, the rail lines, you know, they're doing this to CN and CP. Simultaneously, the rail lines are essentially, everybody talks about, you know, supply chains. Well, <laughs> that's the supply chain. Well, like nothing is, I don't think people realize, I, I'm telling you, I was, a, I'm ashamed to say this. Before I started meeting and talking with you guys, I started doing some of my own research and looking at how the extent to which goods are moved on trains in Canada. And I was blown away. Like the, 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 comparison to trains and trucks is not even you can't even make it it's mm -hmm. it's uh you know the trucks are like a fly on an elephant's back compared to what trains are moving so i don't see how they can possibly follow through on this and completely shut down uh the rail lines in canada unless it is their intention their evil intention to completely destroy um you know the country's economy right i, I just don't know how how they can follow through on this they're the, the, the work shortage, the worker shortage they would have um, would cripple them. And, and that, this is why I think that they're banking on uh, you guys caving in and complying, you know, but uh, that's my view. Um, if I'm wrong, then, then the only option is gonna be to, uh, is, is gonna be to sue them as part of what's called a class action. And in the class action, what happens is we we don't name every individual person. What we do is we sue on behalf, usually on behalf of a representative plaintiff. We'd have to talk about who that's going to be because that person will be named as the plaintiff in the lawsuit. And then we sue uh, on behalf of the entire class because all the people are, are basically suing uh, along the same lines. Uh, one exact one recent example of a very highly publicized class action would be, for example, the Indian residential schools class action, where you you had uh, representative plaintiffs who sued on behalf of many, many thousands of, of people who all happened to attend residential schools and suffered certain categories of abuse. They didn't suffer all the same abuses, but they were all had in common that they were in residential school. And they suffered abuses there and they were claiming damage as a result. In our case, we would sue uh, on behalf of the entire group of people, all of whom have suffered human rights violations and have lost their jobs as a result and have thereby suffered uh, damages. So that would be the essence of what the lawsuit would look like, you know, if we got there. Um, the question would be whether we wait to file the lawsuit until say, you know, the 24th of January uh, to see, you know, how many people are impacted or whether we go ahead and file the lawsuit sooner. Um, you know, the, the problem with the lawsuit, it's not the problem, the reality is if we file the lawsuit, you know, we really, you've got to kiss the jobs goodbye. Um, you know, that's, that's the problem is as soon as you sue CN, you know, it's going to, you know, uh, I'd be surprised if you would ever have a situation where you can return to your jobs, right? So that's why I've always said we sue them as a last resort. We're going to try and, um, you know, persuade them, convince them that you guys are serious, that you're not going to comply. Uh, so they won't follow through on their threat to, uh, to remove a whole group, large group of workers be because they haven't, uh, they won't take this vaccine. Right. Um, there was a question there I saw somebody asked about, can you sue without going through the union? Uh, that's a great question. Um, if you wanted to sue for enforcement of your employment rights as against the employer, that would have to go through your union. Because under your CBAs, if you're a unionized worker, 
what happens is the workers contract out their rights to the union and then the union bargains with the employer on behalf of the whole group of employees. However, um, you cannot contract out human rights. Human rights are God-given and they're guaranteed in the Constitution. And in this case, because the mandate is coming from the federal government through a ministerial order, that activates the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So what you would be suing with the way we sort of would sidestep the union, as it were, is we would sue the Canadian government and CN for human rights violations. Um, we can still claim damages. We can claim punitive damages for that. We can also claim damages for loss of income, uh, you know, intentional infliction of, of, of uh, emotional suffering, mental suffering, things like that. We can still claim all those damages, but we're not strictly suing for the loss of the jobs. We're, act, we, we're suing on the basis of the human rights violations. The damages would look much the same, but we, we wouldn't strictly be suing for the loss of the jobs. Uh, because if we did that, then what we'd run into is uh, your un the unions would most likely line up on the side of the employer and say uh, to all of you that you can't sue, you can't sue the employer to uh, to enforce your employment rights. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, that makes yeah. sense. And when the human rights is being brought to the union, they're basically saying under the CBA, those are your rights. You'd basically you don't have human rights uh, because you're under a union contract so again whether or not that's true or not obviously that's not true mm -hmm. but uh, but that's basically what the union is coming back saying like your rights are in your your cba and that's all the rights that you have uh yeah well implicit in that is they're saying that the vaccine mandates are not human rights violations right. uh i'm quite convinced that that's wrong right. um and i can show you an example, did I send you, Abby, an example of a lawsuit along the lines of hum these human rights violations? I think you may have. Okay, yeah. if not, I'll send, I'll send you one again and you yeah. can circulate so people yeah, get the idea. Um, but the essence of it is we're, we're, we're not suing for employment rights. The union, uh, unfortunately, the unions have, uh, you know, they've lined up on the wrong side of this thing. And I think they're going to regret it. Mm -hmm. um, I know my sense is from talking to lawyers in Ontario that um, this is sort of what happened in Ontario, because if you recall, originally in Ontario, the province came out and was uh, took a very hard line in relation to healthcare workers there. And then what happened was uh, there was a challenge involving the United uh, Hospital nurses there, and the union took a public stance in court and originally there was a, an interim injunction um, granted against the vaccine mandate. Then the union stepped in, took the side of the employer against the union and basically said what Abby said. And that is, you know, you can't sue, you, only the union can take this action as against the employer. Um, the, uh, the union went into, they, they, they suffered a lot of public criticism and uh, their membership, understandably, was very upset with them. And uh, my understanding is what happened is uh, the unions then went to the province and said, look, if this thing goes to court again, we're not going to be able to line up against you. We won't be able to hold this line. And then that resulted in uh, Premier Ford coming out and saying, we're not going to enforce this as against hospital worker, health workers um, in, uh, in Ontario. And, and the same thing happened in Quebec. Now, those decisions actually, you may not have realized this, were helpful mm -hmm. uh, to everyone else because it created an arbitrary distinction. And the law hates arbitrariness. In other words, what is the distinction? If healthcare workers don't have to abide by mandatory vaccinations, then why do CN workers have to? Why do CP workers have to? Why do, why do Air Canada workers have to? Um, why do doctors have to? So, um, and, and, you know, why is this, why is the law different in Ontario than it is in Alberta or Manitoba or Saskatchewan? So uh, those decisions uh, will help us down the line, I think. Right. Anyway, um, are there, are there it sounds like there's other questions. Yeah, there's like, lots coming in here, but I just have a couple more. So basically okay. what's going to happen with 
the with the lawsuit if that's where we're going to go towards yeah. something is delivered the the class action would be then delivered to cn's lawyers and then and then kind of then do we just like wait for like a court date or like like what does that kind of look like, like um in terms of a court date well like how does it so you do the lawsuits like you deliver it I guess or, or you're, you're preparing a lawsuit like how the how then does that actually like transpire legally? okay um well this is hard because uh, you know I have to explain to you kind of what what a lawyer does um okay, well then maybe we'll just wait for that one well um, the mechanics of it are um it would have to be a class action brought on behalf unless I mean I suppose each of you could file individual lawsuits I don't recommend that no. Or you could each file individual lawsuits, but in a class action, what happens is you bring the action on behalf of a whole group of people mm -hmm. um, whose rights have been violated. And then the first stage of that is uh, we have to provide uh, the, the case would come under what's called case management, where a judge would uh, would be in charge of it because CN is a national employer we would be able to sue them in the federal court of Canada. So then it wouldn't matter what province you were from uh, because the federal court of Canada is a national court. It sits in every province. Um, and uh, then the next step in the class action would be uh, to get the class action certified. And then once we get, the, the, it'll spend some time in that, in that stage. Um, and then once we get through, through certification, um, that, that's the key stage. Then usually we get into an area of negotiation where the claims are settled. What everyone should understand is that if we have to go to litigation, uh, the likelihood of retaining your jobs is, is very low. Um, there is always, there's a possibility. We don't know, I don't control what CN is going to do. CN might, might come to each of you or individually and, and uh, try to hire you back. Uh, I, you know, I don't know what the future holds. Um, I can't guarantee, and I have never, never guaranteed to you that, you know, that the law could save your jobs because uh, CN, CN controls that. Um, all I can tell you is that you do have legal rights. You do have options that you can exercise. You have legal rights that you can exercise in the event that CN follows through with essentially termination, your termination on the basis of this uh, mandatory vaccination policy. And that would take the form of a lawsuit. The lawsuit will take on a life of its own. It's not likely to resolve quickly. In fact, a case like this involving class actions tend to take years before they settle or are resolved. Okay. I've had lots of questions about that and I'm like, I don't, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> okay. I cannot answer that. So that's good. Okay. Hopefully that answers that. Um, okay, so my next question here um okay i think we're good with my oh yeah do you need members at any point right now not to send to you directly i would manage it um mm -hmm. but like any type of proof like everyone individually is collecting their own you know, her, mm -hmm. you know videos of harassment you know emails this and that and whatever um is do you need anything like that now or would that come during like a litigation situation okay that's a great question uh, as part of the class action what we would be doing what we'd have to do is we'd have to create a sworn written statement from each individual person uh that would set out the factual basis of their claim and of course in each case these would be unique there'd be some overlap but, you know, some people will be more affected than others. And so what happens is we, we create a sworn written statement called an affidavit that becomes the evidence in support of your claim that's part of the class action. And those are created individually. So if people wanted to, they could, they could go ahead and start just creating notes of the relevant facts uh, of, their, of their case, you know, how long. Uh, they've worked at CN, um, their background education, how long they've worked in the industry, um, you know, how this is affecting them, all the things that they want a judge to hear. And of course, um, we will, uh, we can provide uh, 
a form, a, a questionnaire, but, but the original questionnaire was designed to kind of get started on that. Right. Um, but, but those, those affidavits will form uh, the bulk of the evidence that evidence that we would use in support of the class action. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, I can reach out to Megan to maybe get some of those like high level questions and then I can send them out to the members and then they can start writing on it. Uh, so sure. Or they, me. even if they just want to put it in an email form, uh, and, you know, this might be, you know, this might be therapeutic for people just to be able to, you know, write it all down, you know. Um, uh, I saw someone asking if we can, they can charge CN for assault. Um, well, if you saw, I know all of you saw the cease and desist letter. Mm -hmm. uh, it alleges assault. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I think that you, you can. And that's something that I think all of you uh, should consider doing uh, as part of your, of your, your self-help. We talked about the exemption claims. We talked about the grievances. We talked about the human rights claims. Uh, filing a criminal complaint against CN is another thing that uh, that you can do. What will be interesting is to see whether uh, any police constabularies will go ahead and actually file those claims, um, those complaints, I should say. Under the Criminal Code of Canada, you can file your own complaint uh, without the police. Uh, it's called a, a private information. So if the police, if you wanna go and complain to your local police constabulary and file a complaint, against CN of a criminal offense, and they won't file it, you can actually file your own complaint, um, which is, uh, you know, under section, it's under section 266 of the criminal code of Canada. Perfect. Okay, yeah, so my questions are done. So like I asked everyone before, if you can just raise your hand and I see, oh, that's, your hand is up, why is that? Okay. Um, yeah, raise your hand if you want to ask a question and then just uh, go off mute and just try not to interrupt everybody. I don't know how to raise my hand, but I went off mute. Okay, good, perfect, that works. You go, Spencer. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Gray, for your counsel to us. Um, my question is in regards to the religious exemptions. So essentially you got it bang on. Uh, I don't know if you saw the guidance Transport Canada put out, but they literally used the same wording you did of, that religious beliefs must be sincerely held and interfered with in a way that is neither trivial nor insubstantial. Now right. I've submitted all my paperwork to them. It's all it's all in the CN, and of course they just denied it brazenly without even without even reading it. They read three words of it and didn't even read the three words correctly. Um, my legislative rep for my union has said he has everything he needs to file a human rights complaint if the time comes when they actually decide to hold me out and they continue essentially if they if they walk me off the job then the complaint starts. My question to you is what else can I do to be ready for when it goes before the tribunal if it comes to that? Because first we have to do the grievance process and all that, and then the tribunal comes. So what can I do in the meantime to get ready to have as strong a case as possible to bring against them? Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, it's very encouraging to hear that somebody in your union is taking your complaint seriously and is willing to assist you and advance a human rights complaint. That's encouraging. I love to hear that. Uh, I, I don't hear enough of that. I know there are some really good people working in these unions. And uh, sadly, I don't hear enough about them doing things like this. So that's great. Um, the answer to your question in terms of the human rights complaint, um, a lot of people um, that I talk to about the human rights complaints are under a shared misconception, misunderstanding of how the human rights complaints work. Um, and they, they feel like they've got to uh, sort of come up with a lot of really persuasive, you know, Tom Cruise and a few good men uh, legal arguments. Uh, the human rights complaints are actually set up deliberately as a self-help, set up for non-lawyers. So the, the lawyers uh, he, who are dealing with the people who are, who are fielding these complaints, you can think of sort of like baseball umpires. Um, you know, they're just looking for balls and strikes and fouls. Um, and so they have a really good idea of what their criteria are in terms of the law. So uh, the answer to your question is to try to prepare the best possible, most persuasive set of facts, because the facts are like the pitches that the umpires are going to be ruling on. 
So the best facts uh, that will fit these human rights, uh, that fit within the scope of these human rights claims, that's the best thing you can do is, is prepare the best possible summary of facts to put before them. Don't worry about what the law is. That's their job. Okay, they know the law and they know they know what a strike is. They know what a foul is. They know what a ball is, uh, and you know that's their job. And if they don't do that job properly, um, then of course their human rights complaints are subject to judicial review, uh, and you can have them. You can take them up and have them reviewed by a judge. So um, that's my best answer to your question: is try to put together the best uh, documentary evidence and the best anecdotal evidence that supports your human rights complaints. And the best way to do that is just don't leave anything out. If you even think it could be remotely relevant uh, to your situation, put it in. Okay, understood. Um, uh, thank you very much and uh, have a good night, everybody. Thank Thanks. You. Okay, so we have questions in the chat. Um, okay, so there's been lots of people who want to go on stress leave, um, who are on stress leave now because of this. They don't mm -hmm. want it to hurt their, their case, like the case that we're doing, because technically they wouldn't be dismissed because they're mm -hmm. on leave as of right now. They might, you know, terminate that at some point if they're not vaccinated. I've been encouraging everyone to join regardless because your leave could end at any time. Um, and then you want to be, you want to make sure you're included, but does anyone being on leave or stress leave, does, does it hinder their being on this case at all in your perspective? Well, I think your, your approach, Abby, is quite correct. Um, because, and, and for the reasons that you said, uh, even though you're on leave at some point, you're going to have to return to work. And unless this vaccine mandate policy changes, you're going to be subjected to the same the same problems, uh, you know, and and so that's why um, those people can remain part of the group, and I would encourage them and welcome them into the group, uh, because if they plan to ever return to active work, you know, they're they're going to be facing this, and even though they're on leave, they're for that reason, even though they're on leave, they're still suffering damages. In fact, arguably, they're suffering even worse. Because, you know, just the stress of going all th through all of this nonsense has put them in a state of mind, a state of health where they can't, state of mental health where they can't work. And, uh, you know, so that's already a significant damage that they've suffered. So, so why would, would that, take Yeah, would that mean that not necessarily do you have to be technically maybe dismissed from work? Say if you're on leave, we do the mm -hmm. class action and you have damages, you can still seek damages even though you're on leave. Well, let me put it this way: even if the even if CN uh, does not does not uh, uh, impose their does not follow through on their threat against you, let's say you refuse the vaccination and you refuse to comply with anything, and they just don't enforce it against you, you still suffer damages. You're right. suffering damages right now because you're on this call. Right. Now your damages won't be the same as someone who was so stressed out by this that they couldn't work anymore, nor would your damages be the same as someone who was terminated because they refused to comply. But you've still suffered damage. Everybody on this call, everybody at CN, this is what's so heinous about this. It's just, uh, it's so abusive, top to bottom. It's so callous. Yeah. Um, you know, your company is just saying to you that they don't care about you. And, and the ironic thing is they think they, they're so disrespectful that they're telling you that they're doing this for you so that you'll have a safe work environment. Wow. So they want to have a safe environment, work environment. And the way that they achieve that is by browbeating and mentally and emotionally abusing uh, hundreds and thousands of their most loyal, hardworking people. Wow, that's a great strategy. Wow, these, you know, you can see why these guys rose to the level of CEO, <laughs> you know. Like that, if that is, I'm sorry to, you know, if that isn't just a load of horse shit, I don't know what is. Yeah. Um, so any comments on unemployment insurance? I know we talked about it at our first meeting. Right. Now, now they've come out saying that, you know, you won't qualify if you haven't gone through with the, the mandate. Any, like, what would a member do? Like, obviously the first thing if you're laid off, you're going to go apply for EI, I would assume, and I'd try to get another job. But 
if you're denied at EI, what, what should members do? Well, that's another, again, this is another lie that they're telling you. I, I don't know, and, and this is part of what, what, what the lie is and why I talked to you about resisting these, these uh, involuntary unpaid leaves of absences. When you're approached with these, this is why my advice has been respond by saying, look, I do not accept this leave of absence. I'm regarding this as a dismissal. Are you dismissing me? Yes or no. If you're dismissing me, then that's what should be on my ROE. It cannot be a dismissal for cause. This cannot be a dismissal for cause. There's no cause, uh, recognized cause in law uh, for refusing to take a vaccine. So you can't be dismissed for cause. If you aren't dismissed for cause, you are therefore eligible for employment insurance. You would only be ineligible for employment insurance if you voluntarily leave your job. And that's what they're talking about. They're trying to trick you into voluntarily leaving your job. And then they're putting on the ROEs. And I've heard about this. This is heinous, but they're doing it because they have to sign a statutory declaration on that record of employment. But they're actually putting on there that people who are taking these involuntary unpaid leave, leaves of absences are resigning. So in order to prevent that, you have to, you have to go the extra mile when this comes to you and say, okay, let's clarify what we're talking about here. I'm available for work. I want to work. I won't take the vaccine. I'm not accepting an unpaid leave of absence. I will take a paid leave of absence. Mm -hmm. I will not take an unpaid leave of absence. And therefore, uh, clarify, are you dismissing me? Are you allowing me to continue to work? Or are you dismissing me? If you're imposing an unpaid leave of absence, I'm regarding that as dismissal. And then if they put on your record of employment uh, that you've resigned, then you can challenge that with the, with uh, that, that the, first of all, that is the basis for a grievance uh, and your union should be taking that up. Um, but that, that would be a further violation. Uh, in my mind, that would be an aggravating feature of your human rights violation. Okay, perfect. But I think they're going to be has they're going to hesitate to do that because, um, as I said, that that record of employment is a statutory document, and uh, they have to <laughs> file a statutory declaration there concerning why the employment came to an end. And um, they're they're very alive to this. This is why they've come up with this involuntary unpaid leave. This is why they're not treating these as layoffs, right? Because of course, if you're laid off, you're you are almost automatically eligible for employment insurance. So this is the game that's being played. Remember, this is the strategy of the government of Canada. Make no mistake, we're not dealing with CN, we're dealing with the government of Canada. The government of Canada is imposing this on you. This is Justin Trudeau and his group. That's who's doing this. Mm -hmm. CN is the machinery by which they are doing it. And yes, CN is complicit and some of the unions are complicit in it, but this is, this is the government of Canada we're fighting. Thank you. Uh, Seth, sorry, I've seen your hand up for like 10 minutes. So your turn. Okay, well, this is Julie. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that I did give my union in Symington the COVID Care Alliance 20 page document on how unhealthy this vaccine is, hence vaccine to whoever. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. And I gave it to them and he took it in considerately. He actually was telling people to go and get the vaccine shot before I gave that to him. And he, I had some sort of fim, uh, similar event where his brother was dating some girl at some party in the country I was at. And there was like a inherent cue or whatnot, but this guy did take it into us to a degree Indeed, that sir. he's very considerate of him being a unionized person. And in charge, you have to understand he's a mechanic from our shop that other mm -hmm. persons have known. So he's mm -hmm. somebody who's considerate of that. And that's in Symington, Winnipeg. So that's excellent. And, yeah. you know, this is part of the reason. Thanks for that, uh, Julie. This is part of the reason why we frame the cease and desist letter in the way that we do and why we attach all that whole SharePoint package that contains hundreds and hundreds of pages of information about COVID-19 and about the vaccines. Because what we're trying to do, and I stated this in the letter, 
or trying to say to CN, look, you guys are, are a great company. You are populated by very, very smart people. You've been successful for a very long time. You can think of much better ways to protect you, the health and safety, occupational health and safety of your employees, if that is indeed what this is about, than by imposing these draconian vaccine mandates on people who don't want them. There are much better ways, and we can all think of them. I'm sure if we sat down, we could probably write down 50 of them tonight, just ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, things that we could do, measures. And some of them are obvious. They're ones that we learned during the lockdowns. You know, uh, like if you're sick, stay home, you know, um, like, you know, get people tested once a month for COVID, you know, uh, there, there's, there's all kinds of things we can do. If yeah, we even three day work weeks so that we can have more yeah. family time, right? Yeah. Like there's so much we can bring up to the table. Yeah, like that's, let's be rational and, uh, and, and think about this. You know, um, I'm, I'm a trained mediator and in mediation, we have a mantra for what is a good solution to a problem versus a bad solution to a problem. This is it. And you tell me which side CN is on, is on on this. A good solution to a problem is one that is hard on the problem and soft on the people. A bad solution is hard on the people, soft on the problem. I think what CN is doing, what the government of Canada is doing, is they're being very hard on the people. And, and really soft on the problem, right? These vaccine mandates, even if, you, even if you guys all go in tomorrow and get the shot, it's not going to protect you from COVID. It's not going to solve the problem. It's not going to create a safe and healthy work environment to the level that would satisfy the government of Canada because the government of Canada is under the insane delusion that we can get to a time and a place when nobody would ever get COVID-19. And that is just not possible. COVID is out there, it is alive, it is a virus, it is a coronavirus. The coronaviruses are the most successful viruses. They've been with us forever. For as long as there've been humans, there've been coronaviruses and they're very, very successful. The common cold, pneumonia, flu virus B, all the things we used to get the flu shot for, these are coronaviruses. And COVID-19 is just another kind of uh, coronavirus, and it's going to be with us, and we're going to have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this idea that we're going to take these shots and we're going to have infallible immunity and nobody's ever going to die, it's insane. It's madness. Yeah. Okay, Seth, you've had your hand up. Do you want to go so you can take yourself off mute? Or Trevor. Oh, there Seth is. Seth? Yeah. Okay. I got seven questions. <clears throat> Sorry if it's going to be complicated. That's okay. My name is actually Brian. Um, I'm just, that's my email. Is the emergency order over? No. First... Nope. Okay. That, that's why, that's why the, the emergency has not ended anywhere in Canada. That is why provincial legislatures are not sitting uh, democratically as they should be. And that is why the Parliament of Canada is not sitting as it should be. We are still in a declared state of emergency. That's a great question because people have forgotten this. Right? We've gotten so used to it. We're like the frog in the, in the, in the, in the water. That's yeah, up. exactly. Yeah. So sorry, uh, I'm just learning this new. Uh, oh, you have to pause. These are, that that was a great question. Uh, based on the Charter of Canada, and the law of the Charter, should only be overrided temporarily, in uh, wonder. Just give me a sec here. Sure. Based on the Charter of Canada of the law of the Charter of Rights should only be overrated temporarily, wonder re res or reasonably, because as PEG emergency order itself, Charter, how is it for a company that allows 
for, to permanently put employees out of work because it won't take experimental vaccines. Okay, Amazing. I think I think I know what you're driving at here. Yeah. Uh, uh, that being said, mm -hmm. okay, approval under emergency acts. That's the second question. Okay. Okay. So it, it's it's uh, it's difficult to boil this down, and it gets this is gets a little bit complex. Um, but let me explain how this works. The Constitution of Canada sets out the the powers of the federal government and the powers yeah. of the provincial government. Yeah. Also included in the Constitution is the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The Constitution, including the Charter, and the, and, and the Charter is part of the Constitution Act of Canada, are the supreme law of Canada. The, the, the Constitution cannot be changed by Parliament, by the government of Canada, or by the provincial legislatures. Yeah. Any laws that are made by the federal government or the provincial government are subject to the Constitution. And where those legislatures pass laws that conflict with or violate what's in the Constitution, those laws can be struck down, okay? Yeah. So put another way, if the federal government passes a law, let's say vaccine mandate, that violates the charter, that law would get struck down. Now, that answers the question for why the federal government has not passed a law regarding vaccine mandates. Two reasons. Number one, they can't because they don't have the power under the Constitution. Under the Constitution, the provinces have power over health. Second reason is they know that it violates human rights. And they know that it would be subject to being struck down by the Charter. So that's why the federal government has not passed a vaccine mandate law, nor have the provinces passed a, vac a vaccine mandate law. That's why, because it's illegal. It's unconstitutional. Now, talking about these emergency powers, what's happened is COVID-19 has made it possible for feder federal and provincial governments to exercise powers that really, apart from wartime, have never been used before. And there have been challenges in four provinces now, in Ontario, Manitoba, BC, and Alberta, where these emergency powers, these lockdown measures have been challenged. And in Ontario, BC, and Manitoba, the, the, courts, the courts have said that uh, although these lockdown measures violate the charter, that they can be upheld uh, under the, under the uh, Constitution because they are demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. In other words, the government, what the government's been doing is okay because they're doing it in the best interest because of the pandemic. This has been very frustrating because, in fact, um, the governments of, of Canada and of the various provinces have not been able to produce very persuasive evidence on COVID. Um, however, to date, we haven't yet had a court that has had the courage to stand up and, and strike down this legislation on the basis of COVID. I'm lead counsel on the case in Alberta that is going to be heard in, uh, in the latter part of February, uh, where we are challenging the Chief Medical Officer of Health's constitutional authority to pass these lockdown measures. And I can tell you, I've read so much of the science and the government science is junk. It's just garbage. Um, but unfortunately, we haven't yet been before a judge who, as I say, has had the, the courage and the fortitude to not take the party line thus far. Thus far, That doesn't mean it isn't gonna happen. Um, there have been courts in other countries, uh, United States, 
in uh, Australia, uh, Portugal, Sweden, uh, and other countries where judges are, are, have been very, very critical of these emergency powers. I believe it is going to happen in Canada. I think it's just slow to, to come around. And the big culprit, the unique feature in Canada is the, is the complicity of the, of the media. The government in Canada really controls the media. And, uh, and, and you know, I know. That, that's been a significant, a very, very serious problem that's controlled the narrative. Um, there's, there's no, and, and the other issue that we have, unfortunately, is we don't really have an effective voice in opposition in Ottawa that is challenging this COVID-19 narrative. So again, that's a long-winded answer to your question. Um, we haven't won yet. <laughs> We're still fighting. And I think ultimately, uh, I think history is going to be on our side. But, you know, um, you know, we were losing World War II for the first couple of years, too. Uh, and uh, in the end, we all know how that, how that ended. But if everybody had stopped fighting in 1941, you know, uh, we'd all be speaking German right now. Not that that's wrong. I speak German. It's <laughs> Awesome. But, you know, who wouldn't have been, who wouldn't have been good if, you know, if the goose steppers would have taken over the world. Uh, and, and by the way, China is not much different. That's exactly what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Seth, I know you have a bunch of more questions, but I do have a bunch of people's hands up. So we'll just kind of go one question per person just so we can try to get everyone's uh, most, uh, you know, most important question answered before Mr. Gray has to leave. Um, so uh, let's do uh, Trev Treva. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, hello, Mr. Layton. Gray. Yeah, it's hey, Layton. Anyway, is fine. Uh, <laughs> okay, Layton. Um, I am an individual with peace officer status. It's in the province of Manitoba under Treaty One territory. Really? That's wonderful. Yes. I'm from uh, I'm first nation myself. My yeah, my I'm people. from Paguas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're from Santa Louis, Saskatchewan. Carry the carry the. Oh kettlebell. no, kidding. Yeah. Oh, nice. I've great been to Sorbet. Yeah. He, uh, was the chief. I'm just going to brag a little bit. My great grandfather was the chief. He was one of the first Indians in Canada to attend uh, university. Oh, well, no kidding. Yeah. That's good. That sets a good president and a good role model for everybody else. Yeah. His name was, his name was Gray Eyes, though. Gray Eyes? Mine's Black Bear coming in. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> or no That's Yeah. Um, I'm doing a camp where a black bear was coming in. It's an impressive name. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you see your animal, you're supposed to put down your tobacco, right? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, under the Bill 5 Police Amendment Act, it does say that I have jurisdiction uh, within the province of Manitoba if I'm around an addictable offense. Would these actions by the company, the supervisors and that, would that be considered something to where I would have authority to take uh, reports? Yep. To have, uh, yes. Yes, assault is uh, under the Criminal Code of Canada, assault under Section 266, you probably know this. Yes, is what's yes. Called a, it's what's called a hybrid offense. And so it can be treated as either a summary. Most summary or, yeah. yeah. And indictable, that's correct. Yeah. So these I have... Yeah, so people are probably more, most people are more familiar with the American terms, misdemeanor and felony. Summary yes. conviction is, is misdemeanor and indictable is felony in Canada. Anyway, sorry, go ahead, Trevor, I interrupted you. Um, if uh, the individuals like that I talk to um, with their arm's length, like the people that I work with or whoever, if they wanted to make reports, I have uh, the proper um, ways to make affidavits for that and... Um, actual make reports and sign off on them for the whole hand them in. yes oh wow fantastic so i know the rcmp um the lead guy um mr bear of uh, the d division amount of or winnipeg here i could get everybody's report sign off on it and i can personally hand it to him if that would actually help i just want to know if, like so that would huge huge help yeah because and, I already uh, said that if they were to actually try and coerce me, that's why the supervisors at work are very careful around me because I have threatened them before with this. I said that I'll have to 
make a report about this and then go to the CN police because they have to be involved too. Right. You know, that, but that's the sticky part. And then see with Trudeau backing the company, it reminds me of R versus Stinchcomb. Uh-huh. Do you understand where I'm getting at here? Yeah. He was, uh, he was a disgraced lawyer, by the way. I don't know if you yeah. know that. Yeah. Well, yeah, he was uh, everything. All the evidence is backing the plaintiffs, right? Like everything yeah. was all. So yeah. that's the sticky part of why the RCMP going to a federal police uh, force for these things to, even though you have to, because it's part of the process to have proof. Um, I believe beyond reasonable doubt that this, everybody's, this is assault. This is, mm -hmm. and my own personal, like beyond reasonable doubt, this is attempted murder mm -hmm. with these shots. And I feel that everybody can file assault charges against the company, you know, and hopefully down the line, they can get charged for racketeering with the government. You see, that's what, why, like everybody needs to understand the collective, not the individual, but the collective, the government's right. not going to allow this to get out so easy because of racketeering, because of all mm -hmm. these major, major things that, you know, in loose terms, they can get hung for that. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So you really got to fight this and fight this. But if enough people make police reports and they have to do something about it, like for my yeah. own personal experience, you know, when I go in front of a, a lawyer, you know, he's going to say, well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Why didn't you make this reports? Why didn't you act on that? There's this many people making statements. Why didn't you act on it? Those lawyers, they're terrible. <laughs> I love them though. <laughs> they, believe it or not, they make you better at your job. Well, wow, that, that's a great, I wish every peace officer had the same approach. That'll make, because, you, that'll make you excellent at your job. Well, yeah, but unfortunately, it's not good enough for when I applied for the RCMP. So I guess I'm not the right type of person for it. And I don't really care because I'm going with First Nations police after this. But I, I'm just sticking around until this COVID stuff is over because even them, they're all like, okay, hey, uh... They're getting hammered by the provincial because it's a provincial police force, right? So, well, hey, you know, so but, if you want to help the team with, uh, with that, like that would be that would be right? wonderful, Trevor. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, I got the the right paperwork or the papers for it and everything else because I have my notebooks and perfect. Yeah, everybody knows the notebook is a legal document. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. What, as what so much as it, yeah, it add too is that uh, we can claim. As part of our lawsuit, we can we can claim assault and battery uh, as part of our as part of our lawsuit. Yes, uh, that is exactly what I was getting at. Okay, yeah, good. So, and just, so the company has to respond to that assault and battery. Yeah, they, um, do. they do. They they can't sit on it. They can't do that. And I think that could use a lot of bottleneck pressure. Oh yes, yes. But at the same time. Um, I'm not going to speak for everybody, but for myself, regardless if I keep my job or not, I'm going to be making my report and I'm going to be filing criminal charges against company. Uh, I think I would give that same advice to everybody. Right. I'm done. Is there a with way this. Of, of doing that type of thing and then and having like an injunction where CN can for any of these plaintiffs <clears throat> not actually mandate anything? Would, uh, yeah. I mean, the great thing about the criminal complaints is it would have that effect, Abby, because there's no way that they would follow through with this in the face of uh, these criminal charges. Uh, yeah. And I think that's what Trevor was saying when he made that bottleneck reference. Right. And that would buy, that would buy everyone time. Remember what I said, you know, in the, our previous call, those of you who are on it, we've got to grind. And this is what Trevor's saying. We've got to throw everything we can at them. You know, they've got a lot of power on their side, but our power as Trevor so accurately says is, in in solidarity in working with each other in hanging together right you know yes. And, uh, yes that's that's where our power is also it goes along your credibility too yeah no. cn they're gonna look at everything because i've been in front of district like judges and stuff like that mm -hmm. and they even check the police the peace officer police officers credibility so they're going to be checking at each and, and, you know, each like their individual's credibility. And the best way for me personally think for everybody is to write affidavits. Like you said. Yeah. With mm -hmm. proof. Yeah. And then and, filing your criminal charges and then go from there. Cause yeah. you're going to be like, well, 
Trevor, they could say, oh, you're just saying that now, but you know what Trevor, I mean? Would you be willing to, to uh, help out the CP workers as well? Cause they're really in the boat. And if we got them on side with this, you know, that just basically doubles the size of, you know, of what we're bringing forward. Right. Because yes. remember our, our, your, your common enemy is the government of Canada. Yeah. It's really not CN or CP. Right. Yeah. And then, let's, yeah. Let's connect, let's connect after. Um, yeah. And then we'll, we'll figure out a game plan for the group together. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's the funny thing is it's kind of like they gave me the, my authorities and now I'm going to be using it against them. Great, Trevor. Thank you. Grace. It was great. Great meeting you. Thanks very much. Because there's a, a lot of RCMP officers and police officers that are thinking the same way, but they don't want to come out. Well, they're they're next. If yeah, I know, uh, I know yeah. lots personally All that I've been free, talking to. You know, they they teach the Marines. This is how they teach the Marines not to be afraid, because mm -hmm. they 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 get the Marine. Maybe it's the same in the in the police. The way they train you. Your safety is in trusting the person next to you. And in the same yep. way, uh, everyone's freedom is in the freedom of our neighbor. If we're not willing to stand up for our neighbor's freedom, we won't have any freedom of our own. And this is why the government is trying to set all of us against each other. Exactly. It's gaslighting. Yep. Right. They're so good at gaslighting. So, Well, not if we know they're doing it. Mm -hmm. I've seen it all. <laughs> yeah. Yep. The ultimate freedom is 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 uh, the choice to decide how you will react to what someone else is doing. There's a great book on this for those of you who are interested by Dr. Viktor Frankl. It's called Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, he spent several years in the Nazi death camps. It's a wonderful book. You can listen to it free on YouTube. You have to give that, that <laughs> book name to Abby so we can remember it. Yeah, no, yeah, I got it. I wrote it down just now. <laughs> so right I'll tell you guys. Okay. okay, thank you so much. We're gonna go to the next question here. Um, James okay. Betts. Uh, hey guys. Uh, got a, just a couple of real quick questions. Uh, there's a lot of us that work on uh, schedule, so going into work on the 15th or whatever, even though they're laid off. Uh, but there's a lot of us that are on call, 24 hour on call. Uh, what do you suggest that we do in that time frame? Like I'm subject to call to go to work and I have two hours to show up. So is there, is there something that we should be doing there or like call into the office and just say, I'm available. I'm available every day or, or. Why not? Okay. Why not? Absolutely. Why not? And document it. Um, instead of phoning, I would email mm -hmm. because okay. with email, it documents uh, receipt, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Unless the email comes back rejected, that there's presumed it's presumed that that uh, the email was was received by uh, the intended recipient. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, second, real quick question. You, obviously, you know Rath and Company. Um, they, they have big cases going on Great. as well. Right? Yeah. So, is, is there any cases that we really should be watching out right now? That are you aware of, like that that are might be ahead of kind of ahead of our game to set the precedent? Yeah. Well, uh, Jeff is working on, Jeff and I are working on a few together. Nice. Jeff okay. and I are, the, the one in Alberta I told you about, uh, Jeff and I are working on together. Jeff and I are also collaborating on a case in Alberta that, that uh, we're bringing on behalf of some prominent doctors yes. who are challenging vaccine mandates over the doctrine of informed consent, which I've talked to you folks about quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I collaborate with Jeff and we, we share, uh, we share quite a bit in terms of information strategies and so on. The answer to your question is, um, yeah, there are some big cases, sorry. Uh, there are some big cases coming through, um, that are, are maybe a little bit further down the line. How, having said that, this is, this is going to be a really big case. Uh, a mm -hmm. lot of people are watching, are watching you guys. And, uh, that's why it's so important just to, you know, I don't want to, beat the thing too hard but uh what trevor was saying about hanging together and having mm -hmm. solidarity um you know you guys are bringing a lot of hope to other workers uh the cn case is being watched closely um and so uh but i am going to bring all the knowledge and wisdom uh that i can uh from other lawyers with whom i i regularly correspond and and uh collaborate and i'm going to bring all that to all that all that i can to to your case so you'll have uh the benefit of all, all of that knowledge, not just what I possess. Awesome. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, Bill? 
You're on mute, Bill, if you want to ask a question. Bill. Oh, there you go. Ah. <laughs> Constructive dismissal. Uh, dismissal. Yes, sir. Explain it. So when I show up to work on Monday mm -hmm. and they 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 do or they don't come at me with paperwork and such, what is my my recourse? What can I do? Um we covered this a little bit earlier when we were talking about involuntary involuntary uh, unpaid leave. What I'm saying to you is that, that that is a constructive dismissal. Constructive dismissal is a wrongful dismissal, and it covers a broad range of activities by employers where an employer essentially makes the circumstances of employment impossible to continue. And you can see, I mean, there's a number of ways this could happen, everything from you know, from constructive dismissal to uh, racism to, you know, uh, ageism, any, you know, anything that, uh, you know, giving somebody, you know, the crap jobs all the time, um, you know, that type of thing, uh, you know, giving people, uh, you know, big piles of work on, on five minutes to, to the end of the day on Friday afternoon, anything that the employer does that makes, that deliberately makes the circumstances, circumstances of employment difficult or impossible to continue is constructive dismissal. And that's why I'm saying each of you should regard these unpaid involuntary leaves of absences as, as wrongful dismissal, uh, constructive dismissal, which is, a, which is a species of wrongful dismissal. But is there anything specific that he should be doing or not doing on Monday when they tell him he can't work? Okay, we'll go over this again. I would say, firstly, tell them that you do not accept the unpaid leave of absence, that you will accept a paid leave of absence, that you are ready, willing, and able to continue working, and that if they are putting you on an unpaid leave of absence, that you are regarding that as constructive wrongful dismissal, and that that's how you want it documented. In other words, put, them, put the decision back on them where they must make the decision that they don't want to make, which is to fire you. Thank you. Excellent. That Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So, okay. So we got some in the chat here. Does freedom of co-science carry the same weight as, same weight as religious exemption? I don't know. Is, sorry, is what the the co-science cool. the co-science that does the freedom of co-science carry the same weight oh conscience oh sorry Con <laughs> okay gotcha can spell guys so, sorry that's okay so conscience are you talking about freedom of religion or are you talking about uh informed consent there freedom of conscience same spot as freedom of religion and conscience right Yes. Well, no. That's one of the that's one of the things that we would claim that what that is that, that we would claim in the lawsuit. And um, talking about the affidavits, um, some people might claim, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, so, uh, someone earlier in this call described accurately what the Supreme Court candidate has said about um, about freedom of religion, how it's assessed, um, and that would be the test. But if you if you are someone uh, whose uh, freedom of religion is violated by the vaccine mandates, that would be something that you would put into your, into your affidavit, into your factual summary about how the vaccine mandates are affecting you individually. Was that, is that the question? Or does that answer the question? Well, does freedom of conscience let you allow you to believe in any religion? Like, so does yes. it have to be religion, religious specific or just like a greater no. power than yourself? No, um, no. The, the, in fact, it's been uh, recognized. Um, um, First Nations religions have been uh, recognized. Muslim, Hindu. Um, uh, yeah, I think even Scientology, Hatterian. Uh, you know, Canada is uh, is a pluralistic uh, country when it comes to recognizing freedom of, of religion. Uh, unfortunately, the only religion right now that is being persecuted actively is Christianity. 
um, everyone else uh, seems to be, every other religion seems to be getting a free pass. So on that basis, Christianity would seem to be the worst one you could claim in order to get an exemption. Um, but I think that uh, Christianity is under attack for a very important reason. And that's because this is coming from the left. The left are, are atheistic. They realize that uh, the Christians are the people most likely to fight uh, this evil ideology that they're putting forth. And this is really, this is just an expression of it. If you want to know what that is, it's called die, diversity, inclusion, equity. Um, uh, you know, and, and the E in that should be for evil, in my opinion. But anyway, I digress. Um, that's what we're dealing with here. Thank you. Um, Kyle. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hey, yeah, uh, my question kind of ties into the freedom of conscience, I guess. I just I was gonna touch on um I live just five minutes down the road from Grace Life Church and uh given what Another we've one, seen those are great people. Yeah, yeah, amazing. I'm a I, lawyer. Did you know that? No. Uh we were we were down right at the church when they yeah, I did. His, I did try. He's a wonderful man, very courageous man. I've Ray never seen, Tini. yeah, never seen anything like it. So it's he'd um, make a, uh, he'd make a hell of a prime minister, actually. <laughs> I guess but, I shouldn't say well about a pastor, that was bad, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, given the the scene just down the road from my house, there, I just I've, I've been reluctant to mark myself as a Christian with CN or. You know, I I, I kind of want to go a religious route, but I don't want to tell these guys like I'm a Christian. And, I don't and you don't have to. You don't have to. Kind of what you're hinting at before. So it's yeah. I just so I guess how how would I proceed with that? I just request a religious exemption and say I don't believe I should have to take the vaccine, or I'm not sure how to go about that without you know putting some. You're not re you're not re you're not required to tell them what your religion is. I mean, this is the messed up part about it. Is there? And I actually talked to Pastor Coates about this, is they're telling Christians uh, and other people, but I'm, it tends to be Christians who claim a religious exemption, that they have to prove their the sincerity of their religious belief to the standard of a secular test. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really bizarre. Yeah. Um, and it's wrong. And it's, you know, really, um, you're not required to tell them uh, details of your religious beliefs. That violates your right to privacy. Uh, if you're proud of your religious beliefs and you want to express them and you can, um, you know, I think um, this is a problem of conscience for religious people. And it's very sad and horrifying that in this country, people who believe in God or have sincere religious beliefs are afraid to express them. Um, that, that tells us that something has gone horribly wrong in this country and that we need to change it. Um, but um, coming back to you, you are not required to provide details of your uh, of your of your faith. Um, that's not something that they're entitled to know. The best claim for an exemption, uh, the, the the one that's most likely to be taken seriously, is the claim of informed lack of informed consent, uh, because this is recognized under Canadian law and under international law called the Nuremberg Code, and there's no human being on this planet. Who can provide informed consent to taking these vaccines because they are experimental we don't know their short-term or their long-term impacts okay now that's um i guess why i'm asking is i want to give the case the best chance of success as i can so i don't have you like you said i don't have to de declare a religion to cn which is good to know um but to declare a lack of an informed consent like cn's given us two i believe two different forms or whatever one for medical and one for religious. Would I do that on the medical form then? Uh, you can use it on the medical form. It's not strictly speaking a medical argument. Um, it's actually an international law argument. That's the yeah. beauty of it. The reason why they've given you these two categories is because those are the ones they're best set up to, to deny because they, they have no regard for religion and they have their own doctors who are going to yeah, say that, that from what they're I safe and you should never worry about it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll look into doing that then. Thank you very much. Yeah. Is there anyone else? All right, I'm on oh. mute. Uh, okay. James? 
my 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 batteries on my iPad is going to yeah, die. Yeah, we're going to shut it down. If I disappear, it's it's not because I cut <laughs> off the call; it's because I ran out of power. <laughs> oh God. Um, hi, I'm just James's wife. I'm sitting in. Um, just I just have a, thank you. I just uh, James's wife. You better back it up. <laughs> thank you. Thank. You. So sorry. Two quick questions. So assuming on the 15th there's pushback and they say yes, you are in fact dismissed. Um, being union employees, does that involve okay, you're dismissed. Here's your severance. You're on. You know, you're on your own. Or is it like are they entitled to anything at that point or not? That's my first quick question. I mean, are, can people claim severance? Do they, are they entitled? Do they say, okay, yeah, CN says you are dismissed on the 15th for not going along with the mandate. Does that right. entitle two employees to severance at that point? Uh, arguably, yes. But again, severance is something that has been, uh, is a right that has been uh, contracted out and bargained through your union. So right. in order to claim that, you have to claim that through the union. Okay. Okay, okay, makes sense. And then my next question was, um, when they introduced the mandate, it was so back in September, and they wrote up their mandate and put their definition of what vaccination meant. Now, there's a lot of talks about changing the definition of what vaccination oh, is changed. now. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, does that affect the mandate itself? You know, they're, they're essentially putting in a mm. mandate, and then that definition is currently getting changed over time. So yeah. is that, you know, and now they're discussing the third booster. So at what point are you able to say, okay, well, you put in this original mandate, but it keeps changing. Keep changing goalposts, yeah. Yeah, but isn't that what they've been doing from the very beginning of the pandemic? This yeah. is the whole point of what I'm saying to people. This is the slip and slide. This is the slip and slide. And they just put keep putting more soap on the slip and slide. Right. Okay. We, we got to get off the slip and slide. Mm -hmm. uh we we've got to say no to this stuff guys that's what it's going to take we, we we can't we're not going to win this game we got to change the rules of this game mm -hmm. say we're just not going to do this stuff we're not going to comply mm -hmm. and if enough canadians do it there's a lot more of us than there are of them mm -hmm. and we still have the power we have to take it back from these people these people are using this they're abusing the the political power that we've granted them they don't deserve it They've misused it and they've abused us and we have to take it back. Amen. Thank you. Okay, one more question and then everyone can continue on with their day uh, or their evening, I guess. Um, so Sheldon, I think you had your hand up and I just closed it off. But if you have a question, then- uh, Okay, say, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, say we, they, they say, yeah, okay, you can stay, but you guys have to test every 36 hours or whatever, 72 hours. What if you don't want to test? Like what, what I don't question. want to, and I know a lot of people don't want to do that shit and they, and, and it'd be on your, you pay for it yourself. Sorry. I knocked off my poppy. Can you guys all see my poppy? I'm wearing a poppy. <laughs> Very yeah. proud. Me too. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. So you can do the testing if you want to. It's my view. Uh, and every lawyer who's doing these cases agrees with me. The testing is, is in, a, in and of itself a human rights violation uh, because what, what's happening there is uh, evidence is being conscripted from you. Uh, they're, 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 they're seizing a sample of your bodily tissue and testing it um, and in order to, for you to comply with work. And uh, the distinction between this and let's say a drug test is, you know, that's a bona fide occupational requirement. They, they've got to make sure that someone isn't high on cocaine or meth or fentanyl or something if they're going to be working uh, around trains, for example. Um, there, there's no need to, to have somebody subjected to this kind of testing. And uh, This testing, if anybody here has gone through the COVID testing, and I have, it, it is intrusive. It's not pleasant. It's not a minor thing. Um, it is intrusive, and uh, it does constitute a human rights violation. And by the way, I don't know many people who could be tested in the way that, that the testing is being done right now uh, and could endure that over a long period of time, having to do it two and three times a week. Uh, I just cannot imagine many people, I certainly could not endure that. Um, and I think that it's a, it's a prelude to a kiss. They, they're just trying to force you out and get you sick and tired of this uh, testing regimen 
so that you'll stick out your arm and take the jobs. Yeah. Actually, um, sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but um, if you can hear me. I can hear you. Okay. So uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I was in possible exposure. And to be honest with you, human resources or whatever you want to call them, the professionals called me and said I was exposed, possibly by COVID-19. And uh, to be honest, they said, um, are you vaccinated? Um, I said, no. I'm unjabbed whatsoever. Not one fucking jab. Oh, and at that point, they're saying, oh, well, you're going to have to go get tested. I said, no, I'm not. They said, you don't have a choice. I said, yes, I have a choice. Well, your whole family is going to have to confine. Ironically, I live alone. So I laughed at her and I said, not going to get jabbed, not going to be, be tested. I'm going to confine myself. Uh, sorry, what's your, what's your question for the lawyer? It's not a question. Oh. It's a statement. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So that being said, I confined myself for two weeks. And two weeks after, they contacted me and they're like, Are you do you have symptoms? Well, I I, I told them, no, I don't. Okay, you're good to go to work tomorrow. Just saying. Okay. You can refuse the fucking jab. You can refuse the needle or well, Q tip up your nose. Just saying. I, I I agree with you about that. And that's exactly what I think people should be doing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I did. And that's what I'm doing. And it is what it is. But my job tonight or tomorrow is going to be my last shift, apparently. Anyways, just giving hope. That's it. That's all. And I'm sorry if uh, I cut you off. And uh, I'm going to mute myself right now. Thank and you. Thank you. Um, okay, this is good. So thank you everybody uh, for joining. Uh, big special thanks to, sorry, my dogs are just getting crazy. Uh, big special thanks to uh, Mr. Gray for making the time. I know that this is the time with your family and you're on vacay. So we all, I can speak for all of us that we really, really, really appreciate you taking the time today. So thank you. And um, I wish everyone a really good night. And if you have any questions that we didn't get to you, please message me and I'll message them to the lawyer. Uh, to Mr. Gray, and uh, then we'll get those answered for you. So I appreciate everyone's time today, and uh, have yourselves a really uh, good evening. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye.